Uh, so you mentioned going through some difficult moments in your life. Sure. Um, what what has been your experience with, uh, with with depression? What has been your experience getting out of it, overcoming it? Yeah, I mean the whole thing, the whole journey um, th uh, with, the, uh, with coddling the American mind began with me um, in the at the Belmont psychiatric facility in Philadelphia back in two thousand seven. I had called nine one one in a moment of clarity because I'd gone to the uh, the hardware store to to. Um, make sure that when I killed myself that I, it stuck. I wanted to make sure that I, you know, had my head wrapped and everything. So like if all the drugs I was planning to take didn't work, that I wouldn't be able to, you know, claw my way out. It'd been a really rough year and I always had issues with depression, um, but they were getting worse. And frankly, one of the reasons why this cancel culture stuff is so um, important to me is that the thing that I didn't emphasize as much in Coddling the American Mind, which by the way, that description that I give of trying to kill myself was the first time I'd ever written it down. Nobody in my family was aware um, of how uh, of it being like that. My wife had never seen it. And basically the only way I was able to write that was by by doing, you know how you can kind of trick yourself? If um, And I was like, I'm going to convince myself that this is just between me and my computer and nobody will mm -hmm. see it. And it's probably now the most public thing I've ever written. Um, but what I didn't emphasize in that was how much the culture war played into how depressed I got because I was originally the legal director of fire. Then I became president of fire in 2005, moved to Philadelphia where I get depressed. Um, and, uh, and just, I don't have family there. I, there's something about the town. They don't seem to like me very much. Um, but the main thing was being in the culture war all the time. Um, there was a girl that I was dating. Um, I remember, you know, she didn't seem to really approve of what I did, and a lot of people didn't really seem to. And meanwhile, like, I was defending people on the left all the time. And they'd be like, oh, that's good that you're defending someone on the left. But they still would never forgive me for defending someone on the right. And I remember saying at one point, I'm like, listen, I'm like, I'm, I'm a true believer in this stuff. I'm willing to defend Nazis. I'm certainly willing to defend Republicans. And she actually said, I think Republicans might be worse. Um, and that didn't, that relationship didn't go very well. And then I nearly got in fistfights a couple times with, with, with people on the right um, because they found out I defended people who cracked jokes about 9-11. Like, th this happened more than once. And, you know, by that time I'm in my 20s, I'm not fistfighting again. Um, but yeah, it was always like that. You, you, you see how hypocritical can be, people can be. You can see how friends can turn on you if they don't like your politics. So I got an early preview of this, uh, of, of, of what the culture we were heading into by being the president of fire. And it was exhausting. Um, and that was one of the main things that led me to be you know, suicidally depressed. Uh, at the Belmont Center, if you told me that that would be the beginning of a new and better life for me, I would have laughed if I could have, but I would, you know, I don't, I, you can tell I'm okay if I'm still laughing. And I wasn't laughing um, at that point. So um, I got a doctor and I started doing cognitive behavioral therapy. I started having all these voices in my head that were catastrophizing and, um, you know, it gave an over, over generalization and um, uh, fortune telling, you know, uh, mind reading, all of these things that they teach you not to do. And it, uh, and what they, what you do in CBT is essentially you you, you have a, something makes you upset, and then you just write down what the thought was. Um, and you know something minor could happen, and your response was you know like, um, well, the date didn't seem to go very well, um, and that's because I'm broken and will die alone. And you're like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> what what are what are the following? You know, uh, that's catastrophizing. That's mind reading. That's fortune telling. That's all this stuff. Um, and you have to do this several times a day, forever. I actually need to brush up on it at the moment. Um, and it slowly over time, voices in my head that have been saying horrible, you know, horrible internal talk. It just didn't sound as convincing anymore, which was a really kind of like subtle effect. Like it was just kind of like, oh, wait, I don't buy that I'm broken. You know, like that doesn't sound true. That doesn't sound like truth from God like, like it used to. And nine months after I was planning to kill myself, I was probably happier than I'd been in a decade. Um, and that was one of the things that, you know, that the C CBT is what led me to notice this in my own work, that it felt like administrators were 
kind of selling cognitive distortions, mm -hmm. but students weren't buying yet. And then when I started noticing that they seemed to come in actually already believing in a lot of this stuff, that it would be very dangerous. And that led to coddling the American mind and all that stuff. But the thing that was rough about writing Canceling the American Mind, and I've mentioned this al already a couple of times, I got really depressed this past year um, because I was studying. You know, I, I, there, there's a friend in there that I talk about who killed himself um, after being canceled. I talked to him a week before he killed himself, and I hadn't actually um, – I hadn't actually checked in with him because he seemed so confident. I thought he would be totally fine because he, he he had an insensitive tweet in June of 2020 and uh, you know got got forced out uh, in a way that didn't actually sound as bad as a lot of the other professors. He actually at least got a severance package, but they knew he'd sue and win because um, he had before. And so I, I waited to check in on him because we were so overwhelmed with the request for helps. And he was saying people were coming to his house still. And then he he shot himself the next week. And I, I definitely – and because everyone knows I'm so public about you know my struggles with this stuff, everybody um, who fights this stuff comes to me when they're having a hard time. And this is a very hard, psychologically taxing business to be in. And even admitting this right now, like – I think about like all the all the vultures out there. They'll have fun with it, just like the same way when when, when my friend Mike Adams killed himself. There were people like celebrating on Twitter um, that that a man was dead uh, because they didn't like his tweets, and but somehow that made them compassionate for some abstract other person. So I was getting a little depressed and anxious. And the thing that really helped me more than anything else um, was confessing to my staff. That I, you know, I, I, books take a lot of energy. So I, I, knew, I knew they didn't want to hear that not only was this taking a lot of the boss's time, this was making him depressed and anxious. But when I finally told my, the leadership of my staff, um, you know, people that even though I try to maintain a lot of distance from, I love very, very much, um, it made such a difference, you know, um, because I could be open about that. And the other thing was, have you heard this conference dialogue? Oh, Yes. It's like yeah. an invite only thing. Mm -hmm. It's Orrin Hoffman um, runs it. Um, it intentionally tries to get people over the political spectrum um, to come together uh, and have off the record conversations about big issues. And it was nice to be in a room where liberal, conservative, none, none of the above were all like, oh, thank God someone's taken on cancel culture. Mm -hmm. And where it felt like, it felt like maybe. This won't be the the disaster for me and my family that I was that that I was starting to be afraid of. It would be that taking the stuff on might actually have a happy ending. Well, one thing I just stands out from that is the the pain of cancellation can be really intense, mm -hmm. and that doesn't necessarily mean losing your job, but just even you can call it bullying, you can call it whatever name but just some number of people on the internet, and that number can be small, kind of saying bad things to you. Yeah. That can be a pretty powerful force to the human psyche, which is was very surprising. And then the flip side also of that, uh, it really makes me sad how cruel people can be. Yeah. It's a, it's such a it, thinking that your your cause is uh, social justice in many cases can lead people to think I can be as cruel as I want in pursuit of this when it, a lot of times it's you know uh, just a way to sort of vent some aggression on on a person that you think of only as an abstraction. So I think it's important for people to realize that they're whatever like whatever whatever negative energy, whatever negativity you want to put out there, like there's real people that can get hurt. Yeah. Like you can really get people um, to one, be the worst version of themselves or two, possibly take their own life. And it's not as real. Yeah. Well, that, that's one of the things that we do in the book um, to, to really kind of address people who still try to claim this you know, isn't real is we just quote, we quote the Pope, we quote Obama, we quote James Carville, we quote Taylor Swift on cancel culture. Like, oh. um, and Taylor Swift's quote is is essentially about like how behind all of this, there's you know, the, when it gets particularly nasty, there's this very clear, you know, kill yourself kind of undercurrent to it, um, and it's it's cruel. And the and the problem is that in an environment so wide open, there's always going to be someone who wants to be so transgressive and say the most hurtful, you know, terrible thing. But then you have to remember 
the misrepresentation, getting back to the old idioms. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never never hurt me. Has been reimagined in campus debates in the most asinine way. People will literally say stuff like, but now we know words can hurt. And it's like, now we know words can hurt? Guys, you didn't have to come up with a special little thing that you teach children to make hurt words hurt less if they never hurt in the first place. It wouldn't even make sense, the saying. It's a saying that you repeat to yourself to give yourself strength when the bullies have noticed you're a little weird. <laughs> Uh, that might be a little personal. Um, the uh, uh, And it helps. It really does help to be like, listen, okay, assholes are going to say asshole things, um, and I can't let them have that kind of power over me. Yeah. Yeah, it still is a learning experience because it does, it does, it does hurt. But, but do. for but for the good people out there who actually, you know, just sometimes think, think that they're venting, you know, th th think about it. Remember that there are people on the other side of it. Yeah, for me, it hurts my kind of faith in humanity. Um, I know it shouldn't, but it does sometimes. When I just see people being cruel to each other, it kind of it's uh, it floats a cloud over my perspective of the yeah. world that don't I wish didn't have to be there. Yeah, I, that was always my sort of flippant, but uh, answer to that: if if mankind is basically good or basically evil, being like the biggest debate in in in, in philosophy, and being like, well, the problem with, uh, with the first is there's nothing basic about humanity. <laughs> yeah. yeah, what gives you hope about this whole thing, about about this dark state that we're in, as you describe? How can we get out? What gives you hope that we will get out? I think that people are sick of it. Um, I think people are sick of not being able to be authentic. Um, and that's really, you know, what censorship is. It's basically telling you, don't be yourself. Don't actually be to say what you think. Um, don't show your personality. Don't dissent. Don't be weird. Don't be wrong. Um, and that's not sustainable. I, I think that people have kind of had enough of it. Uh, but one thing I definitely want to say to your audience is – it can't just be up to us arguers to try to f fix this. Um, we, and I think that, and this may sound like it's an unrelated problem. I think if there were highly respected, let's say extremely difficult ways to prove that you're extremely smart and hardworking that cost little or nothing, that actually can give the Harvards and the Yales of the world to run for their money, I think that might be the most positive thing we could do to, to, to deal with a lot of these problems. And why? I think the fact that we have become a weird – America with a great anti-elitist tradition has become weirdly elitist in, this, in, um, in the respect that we – not only, again, are our leadership coming from these – few fancy schools, we actually have like great admiration for them. We kind of look up to them. But I think we'd have a lot healthier of a society if people could prove, you know, their excellence in ways that are coming from completely different streams and and that that are, that are highly respected. I sometimes talk about there should be a test that anyone who passes it gets like a, you know, a BA in the humanities that it, it, like a super BA, mm -hmm. like some something like someone not a GED. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that like you know, one out of only a couple, like a hundred people can pass. Some other way of actually, um, uh, of not going through these massive, bloated, expensive institutions that people can raise their hands and say, I'm smart and hardworking. I think that could be an incredibly healthy uh, way. I think we need additional streams for creative people to be solving problems, whether that's on X or someplace else. Um, I think that there's lots of things that technology could do to really help with this. I think some of the stuff that Sal Khan is working on uh, at Khan Academy could really help. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways, but they exist largely around coming up with new ways of doing things, not just expecting the old things that have, say, $40 billion in the bank that they're going to reform themselves. And and, here, and here's my, you know, I've been picking on Harvard a lot, but I'm going to pick on them a little bit more. Um, the And, one, and, and uh, I talk a lot about class again. And, you know, there's a great book called Poison Ivy um, by Evan Mandry, which I recommend to everybody. And it's outrageous. It sounds like me on a rant at Stanford, um, which was uh, – and I, and I think the stat is, you know, elite higher education has more kids from the top 1% than they have from the bottom 50 or 60%, depending on the school. 
Um, and when you look at how much they actually like replicate class privilege, it's it's really distressing. So everybody should read Poison Ivy. And above all else, uh, if you're weird, continue being weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're one of the most interesting, one of the weirdest in the most beautiful way people I've ever met, Greg. Uh, thank you for the really important work you do. This was... <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> everybody watch Kid Cosmic. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the class, the hilarity that you brought here today, man. Um, this is an amazing conversation. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you, thank you. And for, um, for me, who deeply cares about education, higher education, thank you for uh, holding the MITs and the Harvards accountable uh, for um, doing right by the people that walk their halls. So thank you so much for talking today.